just um, trying to correct my accidental double reading. At any rate, so here I am. Uh, in case you're just joining in, I've been reading. Uh, I'm just I'm currently reading one of my dad's manuscripts. Um, in this case, it is the uh, Talisman of the Winds. And tonight I'll be reading uh, chapter four. Yes, chapter four. And just chapter, well, chapter four and chapter five? I think that's where I'm supposed to go. I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure. Because I read chapter, I read chapter two and chapter three. Yep, chapter two and chapter three yesterday. And I re read chapter three the day before. It was a big mess, anyway. And so now I'm going to read chapter four and potentially chapter five. We'll see how it goes. Um, also what I'll be doing is live editing, um, partly because it's my first read through of the, of the story. So I don't even know how it's going to end. Uh, for all I know, there could be some sort of horrible plot hole or something. Don't know. Um, you'll find me coming up with other alternate words on the spot because this was written, it was written a few, uh, well, circa 2002. Um, but also written by a person who was born in 1945 and so ha has those kind of sensibilities and vocabulary. So, I mean, I already have, I know I have problems with my vocabulary because I'm, I'm old. And so he's even older than I am. So he would have had problems as well. It's vocabulary, mindset, the whole thing. But we try and grow, we try and, in and include these sort of things. So we try and, you know, be better, better than we were and try and improve. And that's all we can hope for at this point. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to lead into chapter four, the the Hamlet of Hodrag, Bruhan's Waste. If you are just join, joining me, um, then you'll probably want to go back to past broadcasts. Um, anything that says just chatting is where I've started. Uh, I may start actually putting in descriptions here, but you know, nobody really needs to know these names. I might see if I can try and edit them. I don't know how that works. We'll see. At any rate. Have yourselves a good night, or well, and enjoy. Chapter four, the Hamlet of Hodrag, Bru Bruhan's Waste. As he approached, Thotgold could see that, if anything, Shapakalish had understated the quality of Hodrag. There were several houses there, though in fact, none rated any description better than hut. Charred marks and a few charred timbers showed where a house had been burnt to the ground within the last year or two and had not been replaced. The inn sat not like a king amongst this not like a king among, amongst his subjects, but rather like an ill fortune bandit chief among his followers. It was squat, long log built, thatched roof affair. It was a it was a squat, log-built, thatched roof affair, a single story with quarters in the back and the, for the landlord and staff, and a common room where people could drink and tr where travelers could rest at night. There was a small stable close by, in almost better condition than the inn. The whole thing went well with its situation on the edge of Berhan's waste. The sandy oil, sandy oil produced clumps of stunted grass and, and patches of brush that looked as though they'd gotten discouraged with trying to grow there. The people, few that they were, made do with goats and sheep, all seeming to grow in accordance with what they grazed on and vegetable plots that grew little better than the grass. The story, the, the story was that Bro, Brohan, a wizard back in the day, 
was it Rohan, a wizard back in the days of the Great Kings, long before Thulgar Peacemaker, had been dealing with powerful spells, and things had gone had gone dreadfully wrong. A huge area had burned to ash, which remained barren for ages, and only about three generations ago had it even begun to recover this far. You'd have done better to travel with Shepakalish for another day, I think, he thought at the hamlet doubtfully. Then on the heels of that thought, no, too late for that, he strode down the track toward the inn. The closer he came, the poorer his impression. The doors hung not on metal hinges, but on straps of, of several thickness of rough leather. This was not unusual for rustic houses, or even houses in the city's poorer quarters, but for the inn itself it boded ill. There were some patches in the roof where the thatch had weathered away almost altogether. Well, on a cal caravan trail, he might, he might well... Yeah. Too many wells in that one. He might well spend nights with only the ox cart for shelter, and Wardash knew he could stand rough quarters. Now, if only we have some chores to be done that can earn me a bit of food. Wait. Now, if only they had have some chores to be done that can earn me a bit of food. The common room was empty when he stepped inside. It was dim and the smells were old beer, old food, rancid grease and smoke. Shortly, the innkeeper came out of the back. He looked like a wrestler gone, gone badly to seed but still seemed in good, good enough shape that Thakul hoped he'd never have to go against this man barehanded. His expression was unwelcoming. The innkeeper sized up the situation at, at a glance. Ox driver then, and from Batanchi? And since I haven't had a, heard any ox carts arriving, you're out of work. You'll get nothing free here. This time seemed inappropriate to at the time it seemed inappropriate to correct the man's pr pronunciation of Batanji so Thoughtful answered I don't look for anything for, for anything free if you have any chores I could do I'd be willing to earn a meal the for forbidding expression did not change much lost my stable man last week week and a half ago you willing to shovel, shovel manure Thoughtful grinned. Most times I insist on sh shoveling rubies, at least. In this case, I'll make an exception. Tools in the stable? They are. The innkeeper started to turn, then stopped. If you do find any rubies out there, they belong to me. It seemed to Thoughtful that the innkeeper was not used to jokes. Perhaps if he stayed any time at all, he'd attempt to remedy that. The stable matched the inn in many regards. It soon became apparent that the stable it soon became apparent the stable hand who'd quit had not kept up his duties. The only two stalls nearest the door showed any sign that they had been cleaned recently. And with that and that was scant attention to detail. As he went further back from from the door, matters grew worse until the last doll's grass grew in the light that shone through the gaps in the back wall. There'll, there'll be mushrooms in the dark corners, muttered Thoughtful to himself. A, wheel, a wooden wheelbarrow lay, lay in, a wooden wheelbarrow leaned against the back wall. It had once been hung by a hook, but the hook had, had pulled out several years ago to judge the mark by the mark on the wall next to the next to where the fork still hung on its own hook it seemed clear from this angle the hook that the hook would not let that hook wouldn't let it seemed clear from its angle that hook would not last much longer either 
He set to work beginning with the stalls nearest the door. He soon finished those and went to the ones toward the back. He wondered what inn would leave its stables in such condition, even if the innkeeper had to deal with them himself. Most people who used to pack, who used pack or draft animals might come up with shoddy conditions for themselves, but insisted their beasts be well cared for. About mid-morning, a slat, slatternly and ill-tempered young woman in a shapeless faded brown shift came out with a full ale mug. Says this is for you, she said tersely, her manner showing that she thought him not worth it. Give him my gracious thanks. This earned him a snort and a toss of her dark hair as she left. He raised the mug and something began to bother him. He'd been in places before where the employer might send out a mug of ale, but this innkeeper had been so unwelcoming, and the state of his stables, as well as the, serv the serving girl's attitude, hinted that his habit had not been to treat his employees so generously. So why the liberal gesture toward a mere chance hire? It wasn't that Thalcoll would suffer thirst. He'd already drunk from the well out front, surprisingly good water, given the state of everything else about the place. He looked at the mug and emptied it into the manure in the stables. He held the mug up and looked at it. I'd feel a great fool if it was only good ale, he told it. He set it aside and filled the barrow once more took it outside and dumped it on the now considerable manure pile. All the while, he was putting together a rough plan. Hauling manure was not a task you undertook with ox goad, thumping and tangling your legs. He'd taken it off his belt and set it aside, leaning it against the stable next to the manger. He upended the, the barrow and set, it, and set it so it provided a, a seat. With his back resting against the manger, and the ox goat nearer to his hand. He sat there quietly with his head on his chest. For a long while, nothing happened. He was about to decide he'd been a fool, but he reminded himself they'd be watching, and if anything were to happen, it wouldn't be until they hadn't seen him for a while. He'd stay there a bit longer. Even so, he was on the edge of giving it up when the door opened quietly. That was the one thing about leather hinges. They made little noise. Somebody muttered, Don't know why you want to bother with this one, Endahun. Nothing on him but the clothes he stands up in. If we were in the buying and selling business, Matson, you'd be right. It was the innkeeper's voice. But we get everything he has. Resell it for a few coppers, and that's a few coppers straight profit. Thakil lifted his head. My, my, he said. And here I was just about deciding you were a nicer fellow than you seemed, sending me out of Maga Ale and, letting, and me letting my suspicions get the best of me. They carry clubs, not knives, he noticed. Yes, they'd want to make sure he was out, but they wouldn't get blood on anything they might be able to sell. Bloody destroyer's teeth, cursed the innkeeper. Get him, Matson. The first thing Thought Kill did was throw the fork, sending it spinning scythewise low, catching Matson under the knees and tripping him onto the floor. The next thing he did was come to his feet with the ox goat in his hand. Endahun was big and strong, and Thought Kill knew he, he wouldn't like to meet the man without a surprise on his side. Rather than the more natural seeming overhand blow, the innkeeper swung a sidewise cut at the, at the side of, Thockel, at, of Thockel's head. He caught the blow on the ox goad, sh feeling it shudder up and down his arm. Then as Endahem, Endahem pulled back for another strike, Thockel thrust the point into his stomach, ducking low as the cud cudgel swept upward. Endahem gasped, but managed a backhand that caught Thockel in the ribs, then began to fall. Matson, by now, had come up beside his partner, and seeing the bigger man go down, struck a hasty blow that passed a good foot in front of the ox driver. 
and began to flee. With a quick step forward, Thotgull hit him across the back of the neck, heard bone crack, and watched the man smack into the door jam. He turned to Endahun and stabbed the goad through his throat, not so much saving him the agony of a belly wound, but just making sure he wouldn't use his great strength to pull himself to his feet again and attempt to continue the fight. Thotgull walked out of the stable, stabbed the goad into the ground twice to remove the blood, and then walked into the inn. The first thing that happened was that, was that the serving woman attempted to crown him with a water pot. He caught her wrist with one hand while he hit her in the pit of the stomach with the butt end of the goad. Winded, she fell to the floor. He swung the goad around and directed the sharp point at her eyes. He had no wish to kill her. She was no better than the men, but dispensing justi justice was not his job. Right. The two of them are dead, so there's just the two of us. I don't have anything against you, so if you'll show me where he keeps the money, I'll save a bit for you. As he, he expected, she had no loyalty to her employer, and the thought of having a few coins weighed much heavier in her mind. Still bent over and, and holding her middle, she staggered back to, to where she showed him a small jar. Right. Pour it over there on the table. She did so. He was a bit disappointed that nothing came out but three silver pieces and four copper. He separated out one coin with the ox goat's point and looked at her. Take it. She snatched the coin, looking at him warily, suspecting some trick for her experience. For her experience said that people never let her have anything valuable. He swept up the rest. Now go. Go where? Or go where? Go anywhere. I'm going to watch the, at the door to make sure you get out of sight. You might want to take a loaf of bread, too. What about you? What are you going to do? Don't you worry about me. Just take care of yourself. You don't want some company? No, I won't, ha won't say I'd soon have the company of a scorpion, but that might be unfair to the scorpion. From the snarl on her face, he thought whatever direction he went from there, he'd best not take the direction she took. With a loaf of bread and the better part of a roast fowl in a sack, she went out the door. As promised, he watched her well out of sight before he turned away. He knew it was possible she might turn turn back and find someone in the in one of the other houses who'd helped her, her deal with a stranger in return for the inn. But he did not intend to be around long himself. He was sure there was more money to go around, quite possibly hidden under the fireplace, but he wasn't going to bother searching for it. Following the girl's example, he something out a couple loaves of bread and some roast goat into a bag. He also found an empty water wine skin, which he intended to fill at the well as he left. He searched out a large wooden platter. He took this and dug out a large heap of coals from the fire. He tossed over into the, these he tossed over into the common room where they began to smolder in the rushes on the floor. Tossing the wooden platter after them, he went out the door. The girl had gone northwest, so he sa set off southwest. It was not quite the, in the direction of Juan Zascos, which was another point in its favor. He didn't look back for some time, and when he did, there was a smoke rising in a thick pillar behind him. Perhaps a bit extreme for vengeance, but the next proprietor would probably run the same sort of business, and woe to lone travelers, or even unwary pairs. The road, to his disappointment, curved around in the direction of Wenzaskos. It forked later on, however, and he took the more southerly fork. There was an old abandoned lumber camp in the hills, away from the towns and much of civilization, where new trees and old rot rotted stumps stood side by side. The buildings themselves had long ago rotted away, so Lucy and Dalthorio had their meeting in the open, each with only three attendants. Dalthorio, 
was in his usual peevish state, though his small frame was stylishly dressed in crimson and yellow, topped by a black cap. Lady, I still don't see why the message was left with you when it is to me that the talisman is to come. Lucy t kept herself from sighing and managed her consoling smile. We had all agreed that we would limit who is to risk and how much. We determined that communications should be through me so that if messages were intercepted, only I would be at risk. And it was decided that the talisman should go to you as a, as a soft to your vanity to keep you and your forces on our side. But I oughtn't even to think of that sort of thing. <clears throat> Dalthorio muttered something to himself. Lucy pulled herself erect. Perhaps it was time to be the queen again, to bring Dalthorio into line. She couldn't do it too often, she knew, lest it have the opposite effect to what was intended. Dalthorio looked up, startlement on his face, and before she could speak, he said, Your pardon, lady. You are, of course, in command. Lucy was startled in her turn, and a little uneasy that a mere change in posture, posture could elicit su such a response. She might have felt gratified if it, had it not been for a suspicion that this could be the first sign of trouble. Was he, perhaps, anxious to maintain his status, at least until this talisman had arrived? And something so powerful that it might help them cast off Wenz's overlordship? Might it not take, make the wielder powerful in whatever cause? Dalthorio had been assured frequently that his forces were necessary. For all that, though, it seemed that he could not convince himself he was indispensable to the cause. Might he do something foolish if he could not feel, feel himself significant? She used her most sincere smile. These are trying times for all, loyal Dothario. The talisman may just give us the advantage we need to win our freedom with, with from bloody Narnish. We are staking a great deal on it, all of us. What of our hopes to detach some or any of his nobles to convince them to be at least dilatory in their service, if not outright throw their lot in with us? Well, noble lady, my agents have done all that they can be asked of them, though perhaps some, at any rate, there is a great deal of dissatisfaction, disaffection among the nobility of Wentz, due to Narnish's constant distrust of them. For all that, though, the normal attitude of, Wentz, of the Wentz noble is that it, we of Ascos are little better than the beasts of the fields. Lucy nodded. Yes, any person of Ascos felt that intolerance, and the closer to Nar Bloody Narnish's capital one went, the more strongly it was felt. If any, if even one aristro aristocrat of a moderate status joined the rebellion, it could make a vital difference. The difference, for instance, between a victory that allowed them time to rebuild and a victory so ruinous as to require an equally ruinous race to rebuild before Wentz could recover its strength. The latter cause would result in dis disaffected people in Ascos straining under a burden of double and triple taxes, with altogether too many men still serving as soldiers when they ought to be at home tilling the fields. Dalthorio was waiting for a response, and only one was possible. You have done well, Dalthorio. Let none fault you your efforts. Continue with your work, and perhaps an opening will show itself. Lord Isakoman Redishin's home was stoutly built of wood and stone. The walls inside, particularly here in the high vaulted room where most of his business was conducted, were adorned with hangings representing scenes from events stretching back along the years from the time of Thogor Peacemaker to the High Kings. He himself was becoming gray, though lean and fit, his hands and face showing wares, wear from years of working in, in all weather. He smiled grimly at the letter in his hand. 
So, his royal lord required more draft of his drafts of his troops. He must pr raise, pray, raise, pay, and victu victual cavalry, bowmen, and slingers, and pikemen for his lord to help quell the nuisance of disaffection among the Ascos. Disakoman had his agents nosing around with care. Only a fool would trust in a, in a king's uneasing benevolence. And there were some hints that Narnish was concerned with more things than keeping the Ascos down. The main reason behind these continual demands was in part to draw away trained men and treasure from Disakoman. This in, would in turn make him think long and hard before attempting to unseat his king. The worst annoyance that Disakoman had no intention of unseating the king. The pale doctor of his was just a little too watchful. When Narnish died, however, and the confusion reigned, then indeed the time might be right to step into his place. Narnish had an error, of course. But Narnish had made sure that he was a nobody. Sons had overthrown fathers before. Disakoman felt himself scowl scowling as if he indeed, these little irritations, demands here, demands there, were intended to goad him into outright rebellion. At, at which time Narnish would fall on him like a mountain, smashing him thoroughly and scattering his possessions among others so that nobody would be quite so strong as Disakoman had been. He handed the letter to his son, that fine young man who mirrored his own lanky height, slender fingers and long face, just now attempting to copy, attempting a copy of, his, of Disakoman's own square cut brown beard. Wardash Garden Guide. Had he ever been so young himself? What'd you make of this, Fulsadun? He kept few secrets from his son. The man, young man would be taking his place one day. Fulsadun scanned the letter. I'm not certain. It would seem he wants to weaken us. But why? Disakoman nodded. Just so. He rules by force and fear, and is wary of anyone whose forces seem to rival, seems to rival his own. Beyond that, what do you think of the possibility of his trying to push us into revolt, just so he can break us once and for all? The young man's eyes widened. Might he do that? Disakoman smiled. He might attempt to. But if we are aware of the possibility, we can be patient to the point where he slips. Where he makes so patent a move against us that all his lords see what is being done then we would see what we should see. Fulsidon now nodded. I see. And I hope that someday I learn to think as far ahead as you as you do. Oh, you will. You will. Now, what tasks have you for this afternoon? First off, I'll be watching the, the green stripe phalan phalanx drill. They've been on extra drills last since last week, when I noticed some slackness in their parade ground performance. Nearly fell over themselves performing present Pike's rear. I have to see if they've earned a reprieve. A reprieve. Ah, Green Stripe. That's ha Hackalorman, the half-breed. Sometimes those sort try, try extra hard to measure up. Why put a half-breed in such a position, Father? Because he's good good enough to even be more than a phalanx commander, were it not for the, the fact that his race would have all my other purebred Wen's nobles in fits. No, the unmixed Ascos are not worth training. Even many in the mixed race are, not, are of little value. But on occasion, there's one or two in whom the Wen's blood comes to the fore, and they can do well indeed. The king frowned at the iron ingots stacked in front of him. The problem is, doctor, that on occasion we have ingots of false woods palmed off on us. 
Never twice by the same merchant, he smiled grimly. But I would prefer to have it never happen at all. Now this fellow, he gestured toward a, toward a sweating, stocky merchant in clothes that had once been bright. He assures me he was sold pure what's. Can you tell if it is indeed what's or the trash we've had? Worked on the outside to look like what's, but, on, but only poor iron inside. A problem, but not an impossible one. Dr. Gobnash thought for a moment. Hmm. Have an ingot set here. He gestured toward the table, a table, a side table. The king made a brusque ge gesture, and the servant jumped to set the ingot on the table. The doctor drew a dragger, a dragger, a dagger, from his sleeve, a short but well-made knife, with faint glyphs decorating the blade. He drew the blade flatwise between his thumb and forefinger, humming a barely audible tune as he did so. Then he stepped forward and tapped the point of the of the blade on the ingot. Instead of the ringing sound that might be expected, there was a dull tone, and the ingot fell into dust. Not what it was purported to be, Highness. The king turned to stare on the mer merchant, who was now pouring sweat. Highness, I swear, it was sold to me as pure watts. The price I said... The price was as much as you will pay, you will pay, fool. Think well as you spend the week, next week dying, how tho those are served who attempt to gull me. Highness, if I might make a suggestion? The king's glare turned on the wizard, who, as usual, showed no concern. Well? Suppose instead of wasting the services of a merchant, we send him back to bring what was promised. If he returns with it, well and good, though perhaps the fine would be in order. And if he does not return at all, but goes to a far country where he can laugh at how he's made the pair of us look like helpless gowks? Highness, I had not thought of allowing him such freedom. He turned to the merchant. You, come here. There was no question of compliance or refusal. The merchant moved from where the guardsman had already pinioned his arms and stepped before the doctor. The dagger had already disappeared from a coat from a pocket of the robe of Dr. Gobnesh through a black cloth square. He drew it through his hand, muttering some sing-song phrases in a voice too low to hear. Folding the cloth diagonally, kerchief-wise, he knotted it around the merchant's neck. Now you will go as directed in return. Do not dawdle or the thing around your neck will tighten and choke the life out of you. Best you should not become ill either. I was unable to make the spell tell the difference between lies and dawdling, illness and dawdling. The merchant was shivering. But, 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 how much time do I have? Dr. Gobnish smiled slightly. You have until the thing around your neck begins to tighten. Best you should not waste time, you should waste no time. The merchant, not even waiting for the king's dismissal, began to stumble out. As he reached the door, the doctor spoke again. I wouldn't fiddle with it either, if I were you. It dislikes that very much. With the man gone, Narnish looked at the doctor. Dr. Gobnish, that was well done. The word will pass more efficiently than the idiot dis ha than had the idiot disappeared into my dungeon. The doctor smiled and bowed. Highness, there's a particular shrub that grows in the hills beyond Saragos. Its berries are reputed to have some very interesting properties when dried and infused. I should like to experiment with them. Ha! Even for the king once of one Saskos? Nothing comes free, does it, doctor? Dr. Gobnish bowed once more. I never promised that my services were an inexpensive, Highness. Only that they were worth the price. Okay, so that was chapter four, and I think I'm going to leave it for the night just because it's Friday and I'm kind of tired. So 
Uh, that was chapter four. I'm pro I'm not sure if I'm going to be doing this over the weekend. I'll either be doing it on the weekend or else I'll be, I might be breaking it up and doing a little bit of D&D, but I'll let you guys know what I'm doing as it happens. Um, but I will talk to you all again soon regardless. So I uh, thank you for tuning in and I'll talk to you again soon. Have a good night.